Energy, Climate Change, and Environmental Justice Committee. We're joined by Councilmember O'Farrell, Mr. Gregorian, and Mr. Koretz. I'm going to go ahead and take uh, public comment at this time. So, Mr. Previn, are you here? Good afternoon, sir. You're the only speaker that appears to have filled out um, cards for every item. Not every Two, three, six, and nine. Correct. Pretty much all the items. Uh, anyone else w wishing to speak on more than one item? Okay, then I'm going to go. You. You have two items. Okay, I'm going to call. I want to go ahead and start with you, right. and then I'll yeah. call other 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 speakers. Go ahead. You call after I speak. Okay, fine. So first of all, yeah, not every item. A few items is not the same as every item, but I appreciate your. Get get attention. to the items, sir. Yeah, I'm going to get to the items. Get, get to the items. Okay, so item. Eight caught my attention. Here you have uh, an increase in a contract uh, from 30 to 48.5 million. It's for Hazen and Sawyer, so relax, it's great news. This is uh, the remediation facilities. As you know, 11% of our groundwater, pro approximately 80% um, of which comes from the San Fernando Basin, uh, is treated in that space, I guess, or something like that. And Unfortunately, uh, there was a, some calculation, miscalculation errors, I don't know. They had to round it up in advance of applying for the, I guess it's the Proposition 1 funding. There's going to be $250 million. So relax, it's all going to be covered. But the thing that I'm here to talk about is the city attorney has vouched that this is all kosher. You know, I, it's hard to forget about the LADWP uh, problems with the city attorney's office and the ensuing finger pointing and circular uh, blame game. So I'm hoping that we're looking very carefully at this, that even though this is a trusted provider doing something that we understand, there's a lot of funding sources for this kind of thing, like, like Prop 68, where Kerkori and I are in a pitched battle because there are projects in our district which are applying for funding for that kind of thing to do something we don't even really want in our open space. It's at the rec center in Studio City. It's not on the agenda now, so I'll drop it. But my point is there's a lot of ways to clean water, and everybody is coming up with a great idea. And I'm just nervous that we are getting hosed once again. So I ask you to, to look at that. I wanted to hear LADWP's report on item 9 regarding the recent wildfire. I will draw to your attention that across the street at the Board of Supervisors today, the County Board of Supervisors is afflicting SoCal Edison with a lawsuit over the Woolsey fire, not to be confused with the Getty fire, which is the one that we're dealing with, where LADWP are here today, and I assume we're going to own up because we saw the footage that even though the mayor called it an act of God, there were some issues with the power lines that came down and that caused the fire. Of course, all of this is an opportunity to veer quickly on Koretz, who has been what I like to refer to as the scapegoater in chief on the Skirball fire, which goes back to the December 2017. And it's a shame. It is a terrible shame because he is a great man and deserves much better. But he's been asked, along with Garcetti and Catherine Barger and Joe Buscaino, to carry the water on the dirtiest, most disgusting lie of the 20th century, which is that that fire, the Skirball fire, was caused by a... Uh, encampment fire. Now, thank you, by the way, uh, Super, uh, Ms. Martinez, for going out to the Sepulveda Basin, where they did have a fire uh, that they found was caused by someone, not a homeless person, but they are cleaning out part of that encampment area. That is an encampment area. There was not an encampment area near the Leo okay, Beck Temple. Thank you, sir. Okay, do I, and that's it, or general it, public comment? You'll bring me back later. No general public comment? Today? It's all together. Oh, it was all together? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call a couple of more speakers. Is Adam Lane here? Can you please come up if I call your name? Amanda Pantoja? Daryl Gale? Daryl? Dante Woods? Okay, um, Adam, you're speaking on item number four, correct? Yes. That's it? Okay, go ahead. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Adam Lane. I'm the vice president with the LA Business Council. Uh, we're here today to express our strong support for the DWP staff proposal to expand the feed and tariff program by 300 megawatts. This is going to help the city achieve its ambitious renewable energy goals and will also complete the mayor's Green New Deal plan goal of 450 megawatts of FIT by 2025. The FIT has generated over $500 million of new investment for the city, according to UCLA, 
It has leveraged the federal ITC worth millions of dollars. And when fully completed, it will reduce 2.7 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Most importantly for us, nearly 40% of all the projects are located in disadvantaged communities with high solar potential. It's important to note that of the 300 megawatts, the first 50 will go to continue the current program to ensure there are no delays, and the remaining 250 will incorporate new technologies, lower the base price, and will provide for grid reliability and resiliency. An expanded program is a crucial tool for providing in-basin reliability, something that has been increasingly important during our high fire times. We thank you for your support, and we hope you uh, vote in favor of the feed and tariff expansion. Thanks, Adam. Um, Amanda, you're speaking on item number three? Yes. So my name is Amanda and I am an organizer with Food and Water Action here to support my, uh, voice my support on ELAN Solar Project and urge the committee to approve this essential project. This would be an outstanding and crucial step towards achieving LA's goals to transition to 100% renewable energy. In order to phase out our reliance on fossil fuels that for far too long has polluted marginalized communities and have proved costly for people and the planet, we must transition our grid to a public utility that comes from a clean source, that would be ELAN. This project also does not leave workers behind, which is another reason why I believe the committee should get behind this project. Elon would create good union job opportunities, which our city needs. A fair and just transition is possible if we support the implementation of innovative projects like Elon. Thank you. Thank you. You guys can go ahead and sit down. I'm going to call two more speakers. Hugo Garcia. Hugo, I thought I saw you. Come on up. Uh, Jasmine Vargas. <coughs> Daryl, go ahead. You're speaking on item number three. Yes, I'm Daryl, and I'm here representing the Sierra Club Environmental Justice Committee. I'm very much in favor of the ELAN project and uh, its expansion and battery storage, and I'm also very much in favor of using good union jobs to support that. Um, millions of Americans have been brainwashed by SoCal Gas and those kinds of companies and CNN thinking that methane is clean and natural. It is not. The sooner we get away from these filthy, polluting, carcinogenic gas plants, the better. So I'm very much hoping that you will vote for these cleaner projects. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dante, you're speaking on item number, th I'm sorry, you're just general public comment? Correct. That's it? Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, chairperson and committee members. My name is Dante Woods, lead organizer with Stand LA, Stand Together Against Neighborhood Drilling. First, I want to thank you and your staff for great attention in pushing a 2,500-foot setback forward. Uh, secondly, I'm here today to urge this committee to continue to move the 2,500-foot setback ordinance forward and let this committee here know that there are thousands of residents, uh, Los Angeles residents, who want to see the end of urban oil drilling. And third, no drilling where we're living. Thank you. Thank you, Dante. Um, thank you, sir. I'm going to call a couple more speakers. Um, Jonathan Port, are you here? Come on up. Juan Ortega. Mr. Garcia, you are speaking on general public comment? General. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Good afternoon, Chairperson and committee members. Uh, Hugo Garcia, Esperanza Community Housing, Campaign Coordinator for Environmental Justice, uh, and the People Not Pozos campaign and member of the Stand LA campaign. On behalf of Stand LA and People Not Pozos, I want to thank the committee uh, for hearing the residents at the, that, were effect, that have been affected by oil drilling in residential communities at your meeting on October the 15th. Uh, Stand and People Not Pozos are looking forward to the next steps involving our campaign for a 2,500 foot buffer and the opinion from the city attorney. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Jasmine, what items did you sign up for? I don't have you down and for that, and item number four. Item four is what I have you down for. Was the other item? Mm. Item number three. Three and four? Okay. That's right. So two minutes. Go ahead. Thank you so much, and thank you for having us here today. I'm Jasmine Vargas. I'm the Senior Organizer for Food and Water Action, and I'm here today because I want to uh, show you and, and, and inform you that there's a lot of folks in this community in L.A. that are eager to get us, us 
uh, fast as possible to 100% clean energy um, by the year 2030. And Elon, uh, as a solar and battery storage project together, being the cheapest that it is, and uh, being that the developers have made a effort to create project labor agreements with other um, unions, we think that it's a great example of what our future just transition will look like. Uh, we want these jobs that we're creating as we're phasing out of fossil fuels to be clean energy jobs and union jobs. Um, it's also part of our bigger picture on how to create more reliability and resiliency for the grid as we're going to 100% clean energy. Um, Council Member Koretz and Council Member Kokorian both are leaders in making sure that the city is doing, uh, moving to 100% clean energy. They've uh, passed, uh, with all of your support, a resolution to, cre uh, to create a study that I've been part of, the 100% NREL study, which is supposed to be done um, by next year. And in that process, we have learned that we have to do both and. We have to do um, bigger solar projects like Elon that are union projects, but also in-basin projects. So this is where the fit and tariff comes in. Expanding that will help us create local solar, um, local opportunities for energy production, which will increase our resiliency, especially when out-of-state power lines are going down through fires, and also in making sure that low-income communities and workers have an opportunity in that clean energy future. Right, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm going to call two more speakers. Nicole Levine or Levine, Reginald Kent Keenan, you come on up. Jonathan, you're speaking on item number four. Great, thank you. I'm Jonathan Port, um, CEO of Perma City Solar. I want to thank the the city and LADW for their years of hard work on the First Fit program. Uh, in the First Fit program, on one job alone, we had over 300 uh, union workers a third of which were veterans. We have a veteran training program. So we're really fulfilling the mayor's vision and the council's vision of environmental equity. Um, we're seeing an additional benefits. We've committed to all union and veteran run. About 60% of our workforce is now vet. We're working with grid alternatives on the nonprofit sector. And we're seeing now participation go from large industrial warehouses into affordable housing. Um, one of the great things we're seeing is our customers are stepping up in the greater environmental transformation of LA. We have one large bottling um, or beverage facility. They're now committing to retrofitting and modernizing their whole facilities along with the program. Um, keep in mind in the in-basin solar, there's multiplier effects beyond DWP. When we built the first Costco back in uh, about 10 years ago, it, it was the solar success story because it provides 40% more savings for air conditioning. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Juan Ortega. Hold I'm on. presenting on. What item three. are you speaking on? Can you put up Juan Ortega's name? Item three. There you go. Yeah, go ahead. My name is Juan Ortega, and I am a student at LA Trade Tech College. The approval of Eland is a huge step towards a future where homes and businesses are powered by solar energy. This would be an incredible alternative to the energy sources we use now that rely on the burning of fossil fuels which feed our atmosphere even more greenhouse gases that it already holds. In addition, Elan will create many union jobs for our communities as, and um, as a student at LA Trade Tech College, I have noticed the majority of the students who go there only go there to receive the certificates they need to join the workforce and for them to obtain these union jobs that do good for our planet. I have also realized that many students who are not able to attend today's committee hearing due to classes currently ongoing and simply not knowing about these committee hearings. But if they did, there would be a larger presence of younger generations who want a better future and a better and greener environment with cleaner energy in their futures. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, you're speaking on item number three as well? Yes. Um, my name is Nicole Levin, and I'm with Food and Water Action and also Sunrise Movement Los Angeles. Um, and I'm here in support of the Eland Solar Pro Project. Um, we are currently in the middle of a climate catastrophe. If you look outside, you can see the smoke from fires surrounding us. Um, just like this weekend, there are many articles published in many publications saying that this is the end of California as we know it. Um, I do not want this to be the option. And Eland is an example of how we can transition to clean energy in a just way. Eland does not only create affordable energy that is cheaper than natural gas, 
but it also, and cleaner, it also creates good union jobs and is an example of how we can move and transition to clean energy and also create good jobs in the process. Um, I support Eland and I speak for the many dozens of Sunrise members who are also here to speak at the DWP in September in support of Eland as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you. You can go ahead and take your seats. Um, Reginald, before I get to you, let me call two more speakers. Ron Wilson and Veronica Padilla. Just have the record reflect that we've been joined by Council Member Cedillo. Um, Reginald, go ahead. You're speaking on general public comments, sir? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay, my name is Reginald Kennan, and I have lived for years next door to an um, active oil well and hidden in plain sight. Um, I am, I am, we are eager to uh, work with this committee and this council to finally take action to shut down this site and others around the city that are dangerously close to the homes. Uh, we know that the oil and gas re report proposed and studies and research before the city takes action. Our committees, communities are not uh, guinea pigs. We need action now quickly to move quickly on the 2,500 feet setback. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wilson, you're speaking on item number four? Yes, I am. Go ahead. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Ron Wilson, and I'm an electrical apprentice at Perma City Skybridge. Perma City is a proud uh, veteran-owned small business committed to creating a more sustainable future and extending the economic opportunity to its uh, associates. We save our clients both time and money through the development of unique and innovative solar power solutions. We have proudly served the businesses across Los, Los Angeles. Um, Perma City Skybridge has made it a priority to employ union and veteran labor. We partner with IBEW Local Number 11 to open opportunities for LA veteran population by focusing on hiring protocol of veterans. Uh, we also work with institutions like the LADWP, Metro, Trader Joe's, and Caltrans. To this date, we have hired over 50 veterans and have worked with over uh, 10 pit projects. For myself, as a displaced worker who was interested in obtaining new skill for this program and programs like this to provide opportunities to me and countless others who have earned opportunities to work with great companies who work with the FIT program. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Veronica, you're speaking on what item? Number four. Okay. Good afternoon, my name is Veronica Padilla. I'm the Executive Director of Pacoya and Beautiful. We are a grassroots environmental justice organization working to promote healthy and sustainable communities. Pacoya and Beautiful is excited to express its support for the Feed and Tariff Program expansion. For years, we have worked alongside our coalition partners, including LA Business Council and Sierra Club, to bring solar installations to the Northeast Valley, and even recently won a $23 million Transformative Climate Communities grant from the state to help Pacoima be a model for LA's clean energy transition. A major component of our, of our success with this program is the expansion of the FIT. Alongside Great Alternatives Greater LA, we are creating well-paying local jobs in the Valley for our community. Not to mention creating long-term investment opportunities for local building owners. This program is also bringing cleaner air to Pacoima, which sees higher than average child asthma rates due to fossil fuel pollution. Pacoima Beautiful strongly supports the expansion of the FIT, and we respectfully request a yes in support. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. So that concludes um, all public comment cards. Anyone else? Can I fill a card? Because I'm going to go ahead and close public comment on all items, including general public comment. So that's been closed. Uh, members? If there is no objection, I'd like to move items 2, 6, 7, and 8 on consent. So moved. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to add 5. So items 2, 5, 
6, 7, and 8. It's been moved by Mr. Cedillo. Are there any objections? I'll, I'll have questions about number 8. Okay, let's pull number 8 from Mr. Kokorian. Any others? Can we move on 2, 5, 6, and 7? Okay, without objection, that will be the order. Um, did you want to take up item number 8 really quick? I can't guarantee it'll be quick, but sure. Um, but I do. Do you want me to take it up? I've got a lot of things that I want to add on this. So whatever, okay, so want. I'm just going to go, okay, let's go ahead and take up item number 1. Um, can you go ahead and read that into the record, please? Certainly, Madam Chair. Item number 1 relates to communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Ms. Nicole Newman Brady to the Board of Water Power Commissioners for the term ending June 30th, 2021. Okay, Ms. Uh, Newman Brady, do you want to come on up to the table? Welcome to committee. Um, so why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you anticipate as some being some of the key challenges uh, facing DWP. Why don't we start there? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I have lived in Los Angeles for roughly 16 years in the Los Feliz neighborhood, and I have grown very much to love L.A. Uh, and my, I started in L.A. Uh, working for Southern California Edison in their renewables group and worked my way up through that organization to ultimately running all renewable procurement and contracts and eventually energy procurement in general. I was made an officer of Edison International and uh, founded a water company for them as well. So my background has both water and energy. At a time when there was a change in leadership at Edison, I chose to leave Edison and joined Renewable Resources Group, which is a, a firm that invests in projects focused on water, energy, and agriculture throughout the world, uh, in California, Mexico, Chile, and Australia. But it certainly seems like you have uh, extensive background and experience. Members, are there any questions? Mr. Krikorian? Just a statement. Um, I've, we've had an opportunity uh, to talk to our uh, prospective commissioner, and I think in the time that I've been here, I've yet to meet a more uh, qualified um, expert in the areas that DWP deals with, and I think uh, she will be a real change maker in the DWP, and I'm happy to move her nomination. Great. I would agree. Anyone else have any comments or questions, Mr. Koretz? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we're at a particularly tenuous moment uh, in terms of climate change, and the mayor currently uh, chairs C40. So. Uh, Taking that into account, what do you see your role as uh, as a commissioner, especially in one of the most influential cities in the world on this issue? So, you know, Los Angeles has tremendous infrastructure challenges ahead as it continues to grow, and I think that is the the will be the focus of LADWP to reliably and safely provide energy and water to its customers and doing so in the most sustainable way that it can. Um, that means in, including renewables and expansion of um, uh, storage uh, projects as well. Um, but that also, uh, you know, as we look at what's ahead and what the mayor has laid out as his goals, they're very aggressive goals. And we have to do them prudently. And we have to ma keep uh, our customers' rates in mind as well as uh, making sure that we're able to build the infrastructure in uh, a reliable manner. And, and what do you think of the carrying capacity of uh, our water supply, and what, if anything, do you think we should do to improve it? I definitely think we have to improve local water resources, whether it's coming through stormwater capture, uh, wa uh, water recycling, and uh, local resources. Uh, we obviously import a lot and we will continue to do so as the population of Los Angeles increases. But I also sit on the Colorado River Board of California, uh, which protects the rights and interests uh, of California at, off of the Colorado River. And I know um, how tenuous the Colorado River is as a source. And so input ports will become more challenged. So we need to focus on conservation as well. Um, so I think it's a four-prong approach. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, uh, Mr. Cedillo? No? All right. So um, 
There are no more questions, so without objection, I'd like to move the confirmation of Ms. Ne uh, Neiman Brady to the appointment of the DWP Commission. Second. Thank you very much. Without objection, that will be the order. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, let's move on to item number three. Certainly, Madam Chair. Item number three relates to Board of Water and Power Commissioners, uh, CAO and City Attorney reports and ordinance relative to the Clean Grid LA, Elan Solar, and Battery Energy, energy Storage Projects. Yes, the next Catherine. item is the Elan Solar Project. Why don't we just have our staff come up? Is there a PowerPoint presentation on this? Yes, if do you have you handouts? Would, if you would like to have the presentation. But do you have any handouts? Uh, you, know, you didn't prepare anything? Yeah, we did not. All right, so two, two months ago, I recall that this project was all the rage, and there was so much talk and concerns about the skies falling if we did not approve this project. Um, so I want you to give us a brief recap about the project, what it means for our renewable energy efforts, and, and um, is it consistent with our power portfolio? Uh, and mandates. So why don't we start there? Uh, but you want to start with the presentation, right? Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, uh, council members. My name is Jason Rondu, and I'm the division director for our Clean Grid LA uh, division. And uh, we're charged with, in part, uh, acquiring a lot of the renewable resources, including the large-scale renewable resources. And so as many of you know, this is a really groundbreaking and exciting project for us. And uh, we're... Uh, joined uh, by James Barner, who manages our resource development and procurement um, uh, group, and he's going to go through our slide deck here and give you a summary of, of the history of ELAN and the importance for us in modernizing our grid. Yes, my name is James Barner, Assistant Director of Clean Grid LA Strategy. Um, I'd just give you a hopefully quick presentation overview that we gave to the Board of Water and Power Commissioners on um, and it was approved on September 10th. Um, the Elan Storage Project is, is, was selected out of 130 proposals that we received from SCAPA. We have a rolling RFP that uh, uh, developers can submit at any time an update to their proposal. So we received 130 of those. This uh, rose to the, right up to the top of our list. Um, we have a short list that we work with um, that have met various criteria. Uh, the, what was particularly uh, um, outstanding about this project was the pricing. So it was $19.97 for the solar portion. The battery for the, for the smaller battery, there's two sizes of battery, I'll go into that a little bit more, it was $13. And this project would be in service by the end of 2023. So this would allow us to meet our SB 100 goal of 44% by 2024. Um, the, this project is unique in that it has a battery energy storage system associated with it, and that provides enhanced features to stabilize our, our, our Barren Ridge Renewable Corridor. Um, and... Uh, it maximizes our transmission capacity. So our interconnection is, is 200 megawatts, uh, excuse me, 400 megawatts for this project, for the two projects. Um, and we're able to maximize that use um, and that, so we can put even more projects on our transmission lines. Uh, it also has future ownership options as well, which I'll talk about. It's the lowest solar photovoltaic price in the U.S. currently. Um, and it is the largest and lowest cost combined solar and high capacity battery energy storage project in the U.S. So this this project has gotten a lot of attention in the in the press and so forth. Um, here's just showing the location of it relative to some of the other solar projects that we have and and uh, wind projects. So up in the left hand corner is Pine Tree Wind and Solar Project. Uh, that ties into the Barren Ridge uh, switching station, uh, which we call the Renewable Hub. Uh, this is the Barren Ridge Renewable Corridor, we're calling it. Uh, this is where we have most of our, uh, uh, of our renewables concentrated in this area, um, which is about 80 miles north of Los Angeles. Uh, we have about 660 megawatts of existing solar at this site. Um, we have another about 400 megawatts uh, uh, east of Los Angeles. 
and so that gives us about 1,000 megawatts of solar. This ELIN project is in two phases, so phase one and phase two, um, and uh, that's 400 megawatts total. Uh, LA will be receiving 375 megawatts of that. 20, uh, Glendale Water and Power has joined us as part of SCAPA uh, on this project, and uh, they will have 25 megawatts, or 12.5% of the ELIN phase one project. Uh, so this will give us uh, over a thousand megawatts of solar in this area. Uh, here's some project specifics. Um, the um, battery energy size is, uh, for the standard battery, is 50% of the capacity of the solar, and that's a four-hour battery. That's a 400 megawatt hour battery. Um, the percentage for that particular battery option is 3.1%. Uh, however, we are looking at going with a larger battery. Uh, and this is primarily because it's close to our system and has benefits of providing uh, a capacity that can add to our resource adequacy and reliability of our system. Um, so we do intend to, uh, um, to exercise the option for the larger battery. Uh, this project will give us, with a larger battery, 3.3% of our uh, RPS uh, percentage. With phase two, uh, this project is, is solely with LADWP. Uh, Glendale is with phase one. Uh, this will give us, with a larger battery option, 3.8%. So a total of over 7% RPS, uh, adding on to our existing 32% that we have. And the benefits of the battery energy storage is it allows us to shift energy that would typically only be received in the middle of the day from solar. And we can then store that in the middle of the day and shift it to nighttime. So it allows us to provide energy from 7 a.m. to about 11 p.m. at night. And it's very consistent throughout the year. Um, so it's un unlike most solar projects that just deliver during the day and then it's done. Um, this can provide it um, very consistently. They typically overbuild the solar uh, facility. So you, you literally get a, a almost consistent output through the whole time. Just to uh, go over the uh, milestones, so we're looking at this uh, in-service date of December 31st, 2023. And just to see how this compares, these are the targets um, for the SB100. Um, up to 60% by 2030 is our, our target. Um, and you can see uh, the mayor's uh, Green New Deal goal of 55% by 2025 there in green. And you can see Elin here as it contributes uh, above our current um, portfolio. Soon after Elin um, next year, you can expect a few uh, additional PPAs that we'll be bringing to you for approval uh, to m meet our goals of 44% by 2024. And you can see here this is our future plan, so we're planning out uh, all the way up to 60% and beyond. Do you have any questions? Um, before we take questions from um, the members, I know there, can you shed some light on the concerns raised after the board's action and have all those concerns been addressed? Yes, yeah, so um, uh, might invite uh, our general manager, general manager Marty Adams, to Marty address Adams. some of those issues. I know there were some concerns that were raised yes. at the board, and so I just want to make sure that all those concerns have been addressed. Yes, uh, we had uh, some concerns uh, working with uh, uh, IBW Local 18 to make sure that the city was and the department was living up to obligations that we made as long back as uh, 2007 when we uh, were looking at uh, earlier uh, purchase power projects and uh, had created a process by which to follow to ensure that uh, that we were uh, working together on the RPS policy and the goals as well as how we were addressing city-owned uh, generation both in basin and then also ownership of renewable energy projects all those uh, uh, issues have been resolved and uh, we have agreement moving forward at this time okay. members do you have any questions so good Corey and follow mr. O'Farrell I think this is an exceptional opportunity, um, and it's been a long time coming. It wasn't that many years ago when, uh, you know, uh, folks were 
expressing a lot of concerns about negative impacts to ratepayers uh, from moving to a large uh, PV load. And um, we're seeing now with this agreement that the world has changed for solar energy. And um, I, I guess I have one question and then, well, two questions. One is, how is it that um, this uh, kilowatt hour rate is so low? Um, because I think even in the solar marketplace, this seems like a great deal uh, from what I've seen. So how is it that this is such the economics of this are working so well. What's the secret sauce? And then in addition to that, um, because there's so much opportunity still to be achieved in Bar uh, along that Barren Ridge corridor, there's still so much opportunity for more P utility scale PV development. I'm wondering what the constraint is. Is it transmission capacity or is it economics? What are, the, what are the reasons that we don't have more of that desert floor covered with PV right now? Yes, um, as far as the transmission, it is limited to 1,700 megawatts currently, and we do have tying into that the Castaic uh, uh, pump hydro facility. Um, and we also, um, uh, so most of that transmission is, is at capacity, um, and so we are looking at upgrades uh, that are currently in progress, um, and and so that will allow the Elin project and other solar projects to come online once those upgrades, uh, which are south of our Haskell switching station, that are necessary to allow it to bring into Los Angeles. As far as the first question, uh, this project started out at over forty dollars originally, um, and we kept. Uh, pushing on getting the price down, pr price down, uh, and Eight Minute Energy, you know, literally figured out how to, to how to do this. Um, I think um, uh, basically, uh, in a nutshell, it's it's really significantly over building the solar part of it, and then having a large enough battery that you can store all of that excess uh, solar because the. Yeah, you know, marginal cost for for solar PV panels is fairly fairly low. Right. Um, so they have a very large project behind it, and on a KWH basis, it it you know works out to be very low price. So they sort of reinvented this this project to try to get the price down to be the lowest. Right. Just to add on top of that. Um, bringing so much solar down through one corridor has the benefit of leveraging our existing assets, uh, but there's also concerns about geographic diversity, and some of that's mitigated by our castaic pumped storage, uh, but there are other parts of our city that we'll be looking for adding solar, whether that's local or through other transmission lines, and there's a presentation uh, at the end of our meeting today that will actually touch on the significance of geographic diversity and having a balanced portfolio for solar as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question had to do with trans transmission as well. So we, uh, I suppose, in the next several years, need to really have a very robust and improved transmission system infrastructure, right? And so my question for, for this project, first of all, it's, it's remarkable. It's exciting. It makes it feel very possible that we will reach our renewable portfolio standards. Um, just out of curiosity, how efficient uh, is the transmission that we currently have? Uh, what, what percentage of power do we lose along the way with the existing infrastructure? Uh, I think with the, this particular transmission line, I believe is a 230 kV uh, transmission line. The most efficient would be a DC uh, transmission line, which we have two of those. We have the Pacific DC inner tie and then the southern transmission system goes out to IPP. That would be the most efficient uh, way to transmit large amounts of energy. But this is. And is that where we're headed in terms of uh, future infrastructure for transmission? That most, the more ultimate efficient? Yeah, I don't think they will all be right. DC because um, it's very expensive and you have to have very long distances to justify the, the cost of it, I think, in most cases. Um, how, what, how much capacity uh, it, 
is exists when it reaches its source. Is it 90 percent, 95, 80? Yes, it's it's more than 90 percent. Okay. Um, I, th I think I've seen uh, somewhere in the the worst case it's about 10 percent, um, but I've I've seen it where it's less than 5 percent. A loss. Losses. Yeah, losses. Yeah, by the time it reaches its source. Mm -hmm. All right. It just depends on the distance. It's mainly a factor of the distance and then the voltage. Uh, if it's 500 kilovolts, mm -hmm. uh, it typically has less losses than uh, 230. So, and this is relatively close to our system, so it has, uh, I would say, low, low, um, you know, losses relative to other solar projects. Or I'm interested projects. in knowing more about this as we move forward with uh, these, you know, photovoltaic systems and and the increased battery storage um yeah yes yeah thank you thank you thank you mr alfaro mr Sadio. all right i just you had a slide momentarily and i uh, missed it um I, I want you to go back to i just want to make sure you explain how this project actually fits into our green new deal that we uh, passed earlier this year and only because in that green new deal i spe we specifically called for frontline communities uh, to be prioritized in our environmental initiatives. So I, I, can you explain how this is going to achieve that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll touch on that. So um, the, one of the most important things uh, that ELEN provides uh, with relation to the Green New Deal is uh, part of the Green New Deal includes um, uh, a very quick ramping for renewable energy. And that means the importance for dispatchable renewable energy becomes even more important. And so ELEND is the first uh, resource that we have today uh, that would be a dispatchable uh, solar and storage. Uh, with relation to frontline communities, uh, this project was in development uh, for, I think, a number of years. Um, so this preceded some of the goals uh, as part of the Green New Deal. Uh, that said, we've got a number of projects that are in the pipeline as well. There's a project uh, program uh, change that we're bringing to you for consideration. Uh, today, our feed and tariff that will uh, be part of that. Uh, we're also developing a virtual net energy metering pilot uh, that we will be eventually bringing to uh, the council for consideration as well. So we do have a portfolio of projects and programs in process. This is just not one of those that is in our uh, local communities in Basin. And so um, this really does get back to the portfolio approach, whether that's for geographic diversity reasons or for um, providing local ec economic development and addressing parts of the city that have not had the same opportunity to participate in some of our local programs that historically we've had. Marty, do you want to add anything else? Sir? No, well, you want to explain dispatch? You're smiling to, so from ear to ear. I'm going to, I'm going to let him describe <laughs> what he means by dispatchable because we use these terms. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, so James, chime in if, if I mischaracterize this, but um, what this uh, project will allow us to do is set up a, a renewable resource that could move peak solar production to times that we need it. And what that does is it not only provides solar at times that we need it, but it also maximizes our use of our transmission lines. So rather than taking up all the capacity at a certain hour, we can take up less capacity by spreading it out over multiple hours. It's also my understanding that we would have the ability to change the operation of that depending on system needs. And uh, mm -hmm. James, if you want to chime in on that. Yeah, and so we can, we can either, you know, store the energy, just keep it, hold it back, or we can ramp it up very quickly. So if in the evening time when we have uh, dispatchable uh, gas resources typically mm -hmm. that, that get dispatched at night, this can take the place of some of those in that period of time where we have a big need for dispatchable resources. Yeah. Uh, it also will offset 700, over 700,000 uh, metric tons of, of uh, emissions. So um, that's benefit to the community. So directly to your question is that since Elon will make it look like the sun is shining for several hours longer every day than it really is. And so that then becomes usable instead of firing up a gas plant. Yeah. And so it has a direct impact on what we have to generate locally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, members, if there are no any questions, I'd like to move uh, this item for approval. Sorry, I'm sorry. One other uh, yes, small Mr. thing. Um, since we're talking about dispatchability, um, and Castaic is in the same corridor, uh, with pump storage, we lose like 25%, right? I mean, it's one of the least efficient ways to store energy um, around. And if we are having battery storage that's associated with this 
generating plant, that's far more efficient and presumably will need to use castaic less. Is that is that true or not? Let me. So it would be except remember that we already have enough excess solar to be able to to pump the water to cast dig. So this is creating additional solar on top of that. Okay. So, so we'll have enough solar capacity for both. One of the advantages we've had because of having cast dig is that when, say, the state has had too much uh, solar energy, they've either had to sell it off or give it away for free. We've been able to use our excess solar to move that, that water in form of energy. So even though it's inefficient because you, you know, mechanically you, know, you can never break even, it's inefficient, but it's extra power that's free and available to us. And we'll hopefully do the same kind of thing at Hoover Dam in the future and in other places. So um, even as we look at IPP uh, and looking at going to clean hydrogen, we'd create hydrogen. Hydrogen creation would be very inefficient, except we're already creating the solar energy. The panels are doing what panels do. And we have an option to either use it constructively to some kind of storage or just shut them off. So we like to use them constructively. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I'd like to go ahead and move this item for approval. Second. Okay, thank you very much. Um, without objection, that would be the order. And I just want to remind everyone, this is up for tomorrow, for approval in council tomorrow. Is that correct, Mr. Adams? Thank you. Uh, let's move on to item number four. I'm not sure. Are you guys staying for item number four? Is it a different staff? You want to just go ahead? We're going to take it up now. You might want to just take a seat. Do you want to go ahead and read that into the record? Certainly, Madam Chair. Item number four. DWP and CEO, City Attorney reports an ordinance relative to the Clean Grid LA 300 megawatt feed-in tariff program expansion. All right. Thank you. Dr. Pickles, are you here? Dr. Pickle, do you want to come on up and join us? Because I have some questions for you. Um, so do you want to go ahead? Who's going to lead us in our presentation? Good afternoon, Councilperson, and uh, my name is Arash. I oversee the Solar Program Development Group, otherwise known as the Demand, uh, sorry, the Distributed Resource Development Group here at LADWP. And to my left, I'm joined by Jason Rondu. Okay, so... And Dr. Pickle, our repair advocate. Yeah. Uh, Fred Pickle, Executive Director, Office of Public Accountability, repair advocate. Welcome, sir. So I thought we'd start off with a diagram, which always helps kind of put everything in perspective and to, you know, freshen our memories on what's, what's happened at the council level. Um, so at the top, the LADWP originally um, approved uh, 150 megawatts um, of, of a feed-in tariff program. And that program consisted of not only a set price program, but also a competitive bid model. So we examined both. And what we realized from the um, different bids we got and from all the uh, lessons we learned was that the predictability was key in order to keep the program sustainable and transparent. Um, now, moving forward, what we're proposing is uh, an incremental 50 megawatt um, uh, approval from our board. Now, if we go down, City Council um, had approved back in 2012 150 megawatt runway. And that allowed us to um, get into agreements with uh, these fit developers um, with the intention of uh, making sure the capacity was uh, consumed as quickly as possible. Now, what we realize is we've reached that capacity limit. We've got less than two megawatts left in the program. And what we've realized is that we have done so well with feed and tariff, we want to expand <coughs> this um, beyond uh, what we originally planned, but in line with our strategic long-term resource planning and the uh, mayor's Green New Deal. So what we've come to council with is uh, uh, authority approval to uh, request 300 megawatts um, at uh, discretion of the board to designate those, those pricings. So this is essentially what this change consists of. Number one, an additional 300 megawatts. So we have the original 150 that was approved, and we'll go up to 450 megawatts, again, in line with the LADWP strategic long-term plan and the mayor's local solar goals. Um, the second is increasing the capacity size of projects. Um, this has been uh, some, some sort of uh, feedback we've gotten from our developers saying we want to be able to build larger projects and um, without submitting multiple applications to get to that point. So that was helping uh, from, a, from a processing of applications perspective. Um, also, the uh, reduction of the uh, price cap. So originally, the city council had authorized us 
to, to go no farther than 30 cents per kilowatt hour on a maximum annual average basis. And so what we've realized is uh, solar has gone down, and we've now declined that to 25 cents per kilowatt hour. But that does not imply that we'll be paying that uh, at any point. Fourth item is some um, administrative updates, but also an accommodation to Owens Valley, um, which would allow the government entities, the tribal communities, to be able to build on-site solar to benefit their community members in the Owens Valley. And then lastly, the pricing. This is what would be reflective of a project that's submitted. So projects between that 30 kW up to 500 kW would be at 14.5 cents, at 500 to 3 megawatts, 14 cents, and then another decline of a half a cent for projects greater than 3 megawatts. So the feed-in tariff program has been um, primarily solar only. We've had um, other types of projects, but what we realize is that storage is part of that mix. As Jason and James alluded to earlier, uh, we have this wonderful Elin project um, that will eventually go to city council, but we realize local solar and having that storage capacity is critical um, from a distribution perspective, being able to make sure that we can ride through some of these um, you know, overextending of our, of our system that's going to help keep the longevity of these systems in place. So right now, staff is currently examining that, that correct pricing um, that would make sense for the industry to participate in this. We're identifying zones that are considered areas we really want to target, uh, first and foremost, that also line up with um, the, the needs of the city. So what the plan is to eventually come back to our board and then eventually city council um, probably in the latter half of Q1 next year where we can actually discuss the underlying assumptions, but also how this would benefit um, the DWP and the ratepayers who would uh, potentially take part in this. So with that, um, we'll to questions from your honorable council members. Um, well, I, I want to first start by saying that I'm fully on board with expanding um, the feed and tariff program, uh, but I know that our efforts um, in the past have not been easy. So I just need us to be mindful of pricing and making sure that our investment of our taxpayer resources are well spent. So I wanted to ask Dr. Pickle if he'd like to um, have anything to add on this item. I don't know if you want um, Ms. Collins to join you at the table. Uh, probably won't be necessary. I have a very short presentation on this. Sure. Why don't you go ahead and um, share a bit of your perspective on this item. Um, we have four concerns about the FIT program. One, uh, in this additional phase, the projects have not been bid or subject to a market pricing test. Uh, and if all 300 uh, megawatts were build, built at the top price, uh, that would mean payments by DWP of $1.5 billion over a 20-year period. So our first concern is over the pr proprietary of the pricing. Uh, second, uh, remote utility scale solar, as exemplified in the Inland project, is now two and a half cents per kilowatt hour or less. Uh, that's less than the cost of running even the cheapest natural gas plants uh, versus local solar fit, which is priced in this program at 13 and a half to 14 and a half cents. Um, that's we could get. Uh, five to seven times as much solar for the price we're paying if we bought desert solar. Um, and uh, my other concern is uh, the gap between the fit prices and the latest information on the commercial pricing of building solar in L.A. If you go on the Tesla website to the right page, uh, you will get an ad to buy solar uh, of uh, a quarter of a megawatt which is at the small end of the scale for this program, for 9.9 .9 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, so in a, in a time when commercial buildings uh, of 
30,000 square roof feet uh, can get, go in a few clicks on the web and get a commitment by Tesla to buy solar at roughly 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, my concern is that's an awfully big gap up to 13 and a half to 14. Um, fourth problem is fit is a difficult business model to execute. Um, the easy path for local solar is net metering. Uh, and at commercial rates now, uh, net metered solar, especially at Tesla's 10 cent price, uh, is decidedly economic. Um, fourth problem, and DWP is addressing this problem, their slide four in their presentation uh, is where they're working for the next fifth component, is the existing program is seven years old. Uh, it's had uh, slow progress, poor economies of scale, and only construction job creation. Um, the HUD standard for creating jobs is year-round full-time jobs, and construction jobs rarely meet that criteria. Um, it, the FIT program needs reformulation, uh, and uh, I know DWP is working on that well now. Um, to look at the progress, if we look at utility-scale solar um, uh, purchased uh, large-scale utility desert uh, is over a thousand megawatts. DWP built 25 megawatts. Uh, local solar net metered, largely residential, uh, is about 300 megawatts and feed-in tariff uh, has in service only 66 megawatts in spite of a 150 megawatt program spanning seven years. So it's a program that doesn't work very well as is. And then there, there's the Tesla ad just for example, there's the 10 set solar. Thank you, um, Dr. Pickle. Um, members, I do have a number of instructions and amendments that I'll be making to this item, but um, I'll go ahead and wait until we finish questions. Um, are there any questions? Mr. Kikorian? Yeah, I, maybe not so much a question because Dr. Pickle, I think, touched upon all of my significant concerns. Um, back when we uh, initiated this, you know, I worked closely with L LABC in trying to develop the, the FIT program, and, and it serves many important objectives. The geographical diversification you were talking about, developing uh, in basin generation is important. The uh, spawning a new industry to take root and be able to grow, all was very important at the time. Uh, the world has, the world of renewable energy has dramatically changed since then. And we just approved uh, a utility scale generation project um, in which we're getting dispatchable solar power for basically 10% of the maximum cap on this, uh, on the fit. So um, that I think we have to have a much longer, deeper conversation about whether that premium price uh, for that we pay under the fit is justified in the benefits that it generates in terms of diversification and jobs creation and, and economic development, particularly diversification, because it, it's also not the job of. I mean, the, the jobs the jobs creation part of it is a is a salutary benefit of delivery of power, but it's the utility's job first to deliver power. And, you know, there are other ways that we can do economic stimulus um, than at the expense of the ratepayers. So, so for me, this premium has to really be justified by the energy needs and the economic development part of it is just kind of the gravy that comes with it. So talk a little bit, I guess, about, and, and, and just to put it into a context, I'm not sure that we've really had a very thorough discussion either in this committee or in council looking retrospectively at the years since the FIT was initiated to determine what could we, what modifications should we make now to make it more effective in reaching its goals in the most cost effective way. Have we gotten a return on investment that justifies it? I, you know, we, Dr. Pickle just put up a kind of a brief very brief little summary of that, but I don't know that we've really had that discussion. Just deep discussion, and that's that's my concern about 
dramatically increasing, expanding this program uh, without having that discussion. And then final point is um, expanding the fuel mix. So the FIT was originally proposed as a way to stimulate the nascent solar energy industry and to create local businesses and jobs in doing that and to encourage local generation and development that's more environmentally uh, sustainable, rooftop solar and so on. But if we're including geothermal and, you know, things like this that, that can't be generated in basin that have to be delivered through transmission, I'm not sure why we have, why we need a fit. Why don't we just have a power purchase agreement? With, yeah. with them, I mean. Yeah, so I'll start with the second one, because that's, that's uh, I think, a little bit easier for us to address. Uh, the first piece is the legislation that initially required us to do 75 megawatts of a feed and tariff program required that it would be eligible renewable. We knew that it would be mostly solar. We thought there might be a little bit of, like, wind for pilot projects, but there never was. Uh, there is a, um, is it a biogas project, a landfill gas project wow. that is, We've got one non-solar project, and I think there's okay. a potential for one more. And so we didn't want to shut the door on that, but we did want to recognize, I believe the pricing might be a little bit different for non-solar, and it is. Yeah. Um, this is not eligible to projects outside of our service territory. So whether it's in Owens Valley or whether it's in L.A. Basin, you cannot have a project that is, for example, in uh, Southern California Edison Territory and then participate in the feed and tariff. It has to be in our service territory, it has to be in our distribution system. So we absolutely would consider things like geothermal outside of this process. We'd probably do a power purchase agreement. So I'm sorry, I, within the distribution system or? Yeah, uh, in LADWP's distribution system. So that would exclude things that we have, tra that we can reach by, through our transmission lines. Yeah, and we would okay. want to negotiate through, okay. through, uh, through traditional power purchase agreements or okay. build them ourselves or do something uh, more in line with traditional bulk power uh, procurement. Uh, this is strictly for stuff that we'd like to see in our service territory okay. in, in our distribution system. Uh, the second piece is price. And so you brought up, and, and Dr. Pickle brought up, probably the biggest important piece for us to discuss and have this philosophical discussion about feed and tariff, especially now that time has gone on. Uh, correctly pointed out that the cost of feed and tariff is, by a few degrees, more expensive than large scale development. In the past, we've looked at things like avoided transmission and distribution losses, of course, that'll factor in. Um, but the reality is that every single study that we've done that's looked at what our 100% renewable future will look like, including our 100% renewable study, which we're um, uh, well underway with and we hope to conclude at the end of next year. We've done a number of interim studies that haven't looked at the entirety of it, but every study that we've done and we've conducted me shows us that we will have to have a very significant investment in renewables on the large scale, so things like ELAN that we just discussed, but we're not going to be able to reach that without investments locally as well. And so that means that once we tap out our transmission, we'll upgrade transmission. We do have an, a 10-year transmission plan that includes potentially converting uh, critical lines to uh, DC. Uh, but even with all of the planned transmission upgrades and potentially more, there will be a time where we tap that out. And you also have the geographic diversity uh, issue and the uh, portfolio issue. And so the discussion goes from price, which we know it's more expensive to do locally, and it becomes, do we tap out our large-scale resources first and then start to develop locally in Basin, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, when we actually tap out all of our uh, transmission, or do we do it now? And staff's recommendation is that we do it now. And the reason that we would recommend doing it now is, as Dr. Pickle also pointed out, local distributed resource programs take time to develop. Uh, it's much more difficult to stand up programs and secure mutual investment from our uh, uh, rate payers to be able to deploy these things. Uh, the business model can be challenging. It doesn't mean the program doesn't have value. It has significant value, we believe. Uh, but there are, you know, and, and we're upfront about it, there are challenges with it. To do net metering is a little bit more easy for a customer than to do feed and tariff. But it's not the exact same use case. You might have a warehouse that has very little load, but has a lot of roof space. That's a great candidate for feed and tariff, and it's worth that transaction cost to actually develop that contract with three different parties. And so while there are some comparisons you can make with net metering and feed and tariff, it's not always apples to apples. Another uh, example of that is renewable energy credit. 
with net metering, that has great value for the city and for our ratepayers because it helps bring down our load. Uh, but it has no value for us, no direct value for us for meeting renewable portfolio standard compliance. Feed and tariff does. Every single megawatt hour that's generated through feed and tariff does count for our renewable energy credit. So um, all, all of the points that Dr. Pickle brought up, I think, have merit for discussing. And we are aware of those challenges, and we know them. And we are recommending that we move forward with this because there will be a point where we tap out transmission uh, that it would require building new transmission. We have plans to do that. The bottom line is that we will have to make investments locally. So the choice is, do we do it now? Or do we do it when we tap out transmission? And our recommendation is we do it now because it takes time to develop these programs. So I guess I would just say that all of your response is the pluses and minuses that I fully agree with. The, but the specific answer that we have to get to is, is a cap of 300 a megawatt or, you know, 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Is that cost effective considering the goals that we want to meet? That's, that's the, so I get the pluses and minuses totally, and I agree with it. Yeah. There are pluses to having a feed-in tariff, but might there be a successful feed-in tariff at 60% of this cost? I don't know. Yeah. We haven't had that kind of, that level of discussion or analysis, and that's the part that, about this that gives me pause about yeah. significantly expanding the, and, the program. And it, to add on to that, um, because that insight is extremely important for the next iteration of the development of our program, is today we have this blanket pricing that goes from 13.5 up to 14.5. The reality is we have much greater need in certain pockets of the city than others. There might be parts of the city where we're willing to pay more than that, where we have a, congest a congested feeder where we don't have the real estate to expand our distributing station. Well, we might want solar and storage there, and we might be willing in the future to pay even more than that. The reality is we don't know, and we're going through the development in that study today, um, and we're uh, hoping to bring back to our board and to this committee uh, early next year a revised program that recognizes that locational importance and that locational uh, value difference. So the reality is in some cases, we might be breaking even. It might not be a, a great long-term investment. In many cases, it absolutely will be. And soon we'll have that resolution to be able to direct developers to those critical spots. And I, I'd like to express my appreciation to Dr. Pickle and his staff for spending the time with us to help us develop that program and give us insight into that. Um, he and his staff have invested a significant amount of time uh, with Arash and his staff in helping us formulate what that will look like. So we, we want to express our appreciation there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kokorian. Anyone else have any questions? Mr. Kartz? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what percentage of the existing feed and tariff projects have been built in solar equity neighborhoods? I can answer. Um, so we did a, an assessment about 55% of all feed and tariff projects fall into underserved communities or um, disadvantaged communities. So we use our Cal Enviro screen uh, score as a baseline for this. Great. And uh, do we know how many local well-paying jobs have been created as a result of the feed and tariff? Uh, there are assessments out there right now. I believe UCLA has a report um, they're drafting and should have something available. But um, we do track that, and we plan to track that going forward. We'll be able to get that back to you. So we don't have any kind of a ballpark number right now? Uh, we don't. Uh, but what I can say is in addition to the third-party studies, I know UCLA, um, Luskin School has done an analysis. As part of our 100% renewable study that we're going to be concluding next year, that will include an assessment of um, uh, impacts to jobs, and we would uh, like to address our future FIT program in there as well. So uh, while we don't have uh, statistics for you today, um, you know, we, we hope to have much better analysis in the future on that. Are there every, any other way to uh, measure the positive economic impacts of local solar? And if there is a way to measure them, have we done it? We, at the staff level inside LADP, have not done that. Um, we would be looking to, in the future, partner with somebody, whether it would be UCLA to update studies that they've done in the past or do it through, again, our 100% renewable study uh, to do that. But uh, as of today, we don't have that, that data. Okay. And I'm glad to see us expanding beyond just solar, but I'm a little concerned to see things like biodiesel uh, on the list of eligible technologies. So why are, why are they here? 
how do these technologies uh, support local resiliency and uh, what's the likelihood of fuels like that actually being used? Yeah. Um, so it's my understanding, and Arash, correct me if I'm wrong, is the program would now be open to all eligible renewables. And that was the original design of the program, and that was required by, uh, at the time, uh, Senate Bill 1332. And we modified that uh, a number of years back to be solar only. And we've gone back to do the, uh, you know, open to all eligible renewables, in part because there is um, the potential for, I think, landfill gas being the other. Um, I don't uh, see, and I have not seen, Arash, I, you can chime in if, you, if you've seen differently, we've not seen any, any interest for other renewables, whether that's, you know, biodiesel, whether that's um, uh, wind or, or other. So I'm not aware of uh, uh, any potential projects either in development or even, you know, speculative projects, so. Is there a way in, in case uh, an agreement is, is possibly out there for a problematic fuel like biodiesel that we could ask uh, uh, DWP to come back to the committee before approving any individual project like that? Um, so it would be, um, I, I would speculate that maybe there would be some emissions uh, permitting that they might have to do. I don't know that. Um, I do know that for feed-in tariff projects that are not solar, anything that's not solar on a rooftop in a commercial or an industrial zone or multifamily zone, if your solar project is either rooftop or carport, you do not have to get a conditional use permit through the city of Los Angeles. If it does not fall into that category, whether you're landfill gas, whether you're wind, if you're ground mount solar, if you're any of those, you would have to go through the conditional use permit process with feed and tariff. Meaning, if there was a project, whether um, it was you know biodiesel or landfill gas or whatever, it would have to go through the conditional use permit process. And so the community that would be impacted by it would have the opportunity for input and it would have to be approved by the, the planning department. Is there any way to uh, also have it approved by this committee? Uh, individual projects? In individual projects of the type that, that we've discussed, like biodiesel. Uh, I would have to follow up and, and we'd have to consult internally and, and likely with the city uh, planning department, but we can, we can look into that. Okay, and last question. Uh, do we have any plans to do microgrid pilot projects uh, so that perhaps if we... Uh, hit a point where we have to uh, shut off all of our electricity for fire purposes, that there may be uh, some internal smaller groups that don't have to have that happen to them? Uh, yes, and um, we've been actually negotiating uh, with uh, the Rec and Parks Department for the last, I think, what, eight or nine months now on coming up with a blanket memorandum of under understanding uh, for LADWP to sponsor microgrids at critical uh, park facilities. Um, and Arash, could you give an update in terms of timing of when that would go to our board and when uh, the construction of our first project might, might happen? Sure. So um, as Jason said, we are uh, working with Rec and Parks on an MOU. And what that would mean is it would give us um, essentially authority to uh, move forward on projects on a rapid pace. So we would essentially identify these critical infrastructure that RAP designates as um, resiliency centers. So in case the event of an earthquake, when it happens, not if, um, folks in that community will be able to congregate there, be able to use um, their phones and other you know, critical devices um, being powered by a solar and storage project for that facility. And so we have a project that will start off in, in the Watts community, um, where we're very excited about um, doing this. And it's, a degree, it's called the Green Meadows Resiliency Project. Uh, this will essentially mean that folks in that community can go there if there is a heat wave or a natural disaster um, as a relief. And that um, MOU is expected to go to our board as early as November 17th. Um, and the RAP board on the 18th, and then eventually um, it'll go to City Council, hopefully uh, early next year. And then as far as the Green Meadows project, we will be breaking ground relatively soon in the coming months, and uh, we are definitely underway with um, getting that built. And so while we don't have, and many utilities are wrestling with, what's the utility's role in the development of microgrids? Will the utility maintain it? Will the utility pay for it? Or will customers... 
uh, set up their own microgrids. Um, what, as we sort of navigate that and figure that out, Arash and his team is working on developing a lot of these pilot projects to demonstrate some of the technology and demonstrate the ability to island in the event of a prolonged grid outage. Uh, importantly, uh, today the DWP board uh, approved new interconnection standards for residential level solar that includes the first standards for battery uh, system interconnect as part of solar systems. And that's, that's your own personal home microgrid. That's an important step forward. I think it would be important to extend that to uh, smaller commercial size uh, and that would be a way of helping grow the net metered program by making things standardized as much as possible uh, and allowing those to grow organically. Great. Thank you. Okay. Members, are there any other questions? Okay, CNN, I'd like to go ahead and move this item for approval with the following language. And I'm going to go ahead and read that into the record. Approve the clean grid um, LA 300 megawatts feed in tariff program expansion consistent with DWP board intent for addressing pricing concerns by requesting that the city attorney right. make technical adjustments to the proposed ordinance, which, which provide for the following. One purchase price cap at $250. Dollars per megawatt hour shall apply to the initial 200 megawatts. In other words, 150 megawatts of current program and 50 megawatts of expanded program. Of the local renewable energy FIT program, including projects already completed or in the process of being completed. Two, the remaining 250 megawatts of the local renewable energy FIT program shall be subject to the renew conducted by DWP to determine and recommend the applicable purchase price cap. I request DWP to make technical modifications to the local renewable energy FIT programs guidelines consistent with the technical adjustments made to the proposed, proposed ordinance. Are there any objections? Mm. Seeing none? Okay. okay. So this item is approved with... Madam Chair? Yes, not Mr. Koretz. Might I uh, ask that we reconsider item 5 for a very short question? Yes, so... Um, Which I would ask of the same people that are up here. Is approved as amended by the Chair. Thank, Thank you very so, much. Madam Chair, just um, to clarify, you'd like those technical adjustments made prior to Council consideration? Correct. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to item number 5 for reconsideration. We'll go ahead and vote on reconsideration item number five. It was approved on consent. Any objections? Seeing none, go ahead. That's up for reconsideration. Mr. Koretz has a few questions on item number five. Yeah, I just have one question for, I think, the same people that were just up here. Um, uh, staff want to come back up not. at item number five? Oh, it's new staff. Okay. Okay. So the relationship between... Uh, uh, DWP and uh, Cal ISO um, acting as the reliability coordinator. Um, are we able to formally just do that? Or could we wind up getting drawn into some of the bigger Cal ISO issues? How do we make sure that we're just there to, uh, to act in that very limited role? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Simon Zodu. I'm the Director for Regulatory Compliance and Specifications at DWP. And Chris Lynn, uh, Director of Energy Control and Grid Reliability. Yeah. Uh, if I may, we have a very brief presentation uh, regarding a reliability coordinator. If, uh, if the Chair doesn't it will answer that the that questions. Sounds helpful but, you know, to me. Maybe we, could, maybe we could just answer your question. Um, no, we'll just answer the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the uh, question regarding uh, CALI, so the reliability coordinator is, a, um, a, a, you know, it's a, a mandatory uh, compliance uh, requirement from DWP by the uh, federal uh, regulators. It's part of our reliability standards where we need to have as a balancing authority and a transmission operator, we are required to have a reliability coordinator. Um, uh, California um, ISO is providing this service. Uh, they advertise that they are... Um, they are willing to provide this service to Western Interconnection uh, about a year, a year and a half ago. 
the existing entity that uh, provides these uh, services uh, will cease operation and close its doors in December of 2019. So that's why we're moving uh, to Kalaiso to provide these services. Uh, this service will not have any impact on uh, the wholesale market. We're not participating in the wholesale market of Kalaiso. Uh, we are in preparation uh, um, to participate in the energy imbalance market, which is a separate service provided by Kalaiso. So uh, the, the answer would be this would not have any impact on uh, any other uh, market-related, uh, uh, you know, um, agreements with uh, Kalaiso. So, so any of the right. occasional controversies and larger issues that uh, they deal with, we we would have no way to get sucked into those. Yeah. No, that would not be. There's no nexus between uh, the RC services uh, uh, agreement and the uh, the bigger question that's been uh, going on. Uh, there's no nexus with that. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, so we can, we can just join the reliability coordinator, the RC services. Cal ISO is calling it RC West now. And uh, we don't have to enter into other programs that uh, Cal ISO as a balancing authority has, although we are, you know, slated to join the energy imbalance market in 20, April of 2021. But, but the RC services, we can just join that. So in no way that impacts any of those issues? There's no impact. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Kreitz, you're um, comfortable moving, for, moving this item forward now? Yes. Okay. So if there are any objections, we're going to go ahead and move item 5 for approval. Okay. Without objections, that will be the order. Let's move on to item number 9. Right. If I can please have uh, staff come up on item number 9. This is a DWP report on the wildflower. Fires. Um, so, colleagues, these wildfire uh, fires seem to be getting faster and bigger and closer to home. So, I wanted the department to come up and briefly give us a general overview of our recent fires and our efforts to protect the public and maintain reliability. So, who wants to start first? Um, I'll start. Simon Zodu again, um, uh, Director for Regulatory Compliance and Specifications, if you can introduce yourself. I'm Brian Wilbur. I'm the Director of Power Transmission Distribution. Okay. And I'm Glenn Berry. I'm the Assistant Director of uh, energy, energy Control and Grid Reliability. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, uh, this discussion is timely as uh, uh, pursuant to Senate Bill 901 of uh, California. We are required to um, uh, uh, prepare and develop um, um, a wildfire mitigation plan, and our wildfire mitigation plan is being uh, um, uh, it's getting to the uh, uh, the conclusion phase. We will be making that presentation to our uh, water and power board of commissioners on December 10th. Um, so we're here to uh, provide some updates on the recent fires in Southern California. So, Brent. Yes. Okay, I'm going to uh, go through this pretty quickly. Um, essentially, we had three fires that happened in the month of October, um, starting on October 10th, the, the Saddle Ridge fire. That's the one I'm going to go over um, today. The, uh, when we have an extreme wildfire threat, a red flag warning, we take precautions, and our general precautions, we do not do any essential work in the fire zones. Um, only public safety and fire risk reduction work is done at that time. Um, we send... Uh, emails out to essentially all the crews that are working in those areas um, that they cannot use any equipment that will create a spark, park their vehicles, um, and must have fire extinguisher shovels and radio communications at each job site so they can um, essentially mitigate any fires that are created in those areas. Um, specifically on October 10th, um, a brush fire started in the 1400 block of Saddle Ridge Lane. The fire spread quickly um, in a southwest direction, jumped Highway 5, um, pushed by winds up to 60 miles an hour. 8,800 acres were burned. 16 power poles were destroyed. Uh, this shows the fire area um, where this started. Fire started in that upper right-hand side there. There's a small residential neighborhood there that's fed entirely underground by our distribution system. Uh, we don't have any distribution that's overhead in that area except for our transmission lines that are to the west of that area. Um, Southern California Edison also has a transmission line and a distribution line that 
uh, transverses across that area. Right? That's specifically where they determined that the fire had started. That Edison Tower that you see on the right-hand side of the screen there is where the start of the fire was. Um, our only overhead facilities in that area are over to the left, um, uh, quite some ways away as that's our transmission lines. Right? The fire quickly moved um, in a southern and western direction. Our first responders that went out there, our patrolmen, they identified where the fire was, what the threats were as it moved over into our overhead distribution area. They ordered these circuits de-energized at the time. Um, this particular circuit, the station that it comes from, does not have uh, the ability to shut off individual circuits one at a time. They requested that whole uh, distribution station de-energized, which de-energized the entire area while they sectionalized and slowly brought them back on after the fire had burned through. Uh, on a daily basis, we had mobilized up to 45 crews in that area. That consisted of essentially three different kinds of crews. Our patrol crews work with the fire department, the police department, and they stay ahead of the fire. So they're looking at the direction of the fire. They'll shut off uh, the circuits as needed um, to let that fire burn through um, and also do response for structure fires and whatnot to de-energize the structures that are there. Um, our uh, distribution crews, they go in after the fire had came in, remove the debris, install new poles, and rebuild the infrastructure for that particular area if any of our assets were burned. Our transmission crews um, essentially stand by and they watch the fire where it affects our transmission lines. So where the smoke goes through our transmission lines, they're keeping an eye on where the fire and how it um, infiltrates that, that asset. We had a total of 17,244 customers that lost service. 100% of our customers were back on within 24 hours. Um, we activated the emergency operations center they set up at the Hanson Dam. Um, we populated that with the water and power uh, employees to uh, relay information to the fire and to the police uh, and to the administration offices. As a total, as of now, we replaced 40 poles in that area, uh, over 4,000 feet of overhead conductor, over 150 feet of underground conductor replaced. Uh, this is a sample of some of the work that was done out there. So all of the old wooden pole structures have been replaced with steel poles. Uh, this is one of the rare occasions where you see water and power really closely together. Uh, um, some of the work uh, obviously was very easily along the streets. Some of this work was also done uh, up on the hillsides and where these lines go up and over the mountains. So this wasn't an easy restoration for our crews. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but we replaced all the poles and wires in that area. The bigger concern, you know, we, this isn't a high distribution area for us, so we don't have a lot of distribution facilities. Most of it's underground in the residential. The rest of it is all um, it, uh, uh, forest land and, and, and barren land where we don't have a lot of residential customers. But what we do have is essentially where our bottleneck, where our transmission lines come through that corridor through Silmar. Um, if you look at this particular area, this is from uh, the southern area looking north. This is where our transmission lines all come together and come down and feed the city. Um, that the one tower that you see crossing in the front is the Edison line that, that transverses across our, our uh, transmission lines at this particular area. Right. You can see what happened in the fire here. Our biggest concern when we have fire in our transmission, we have steel towers that are very resilient to the fire uh, going through, um, but what we're not resilient to is the smoke that is created from the fire that goes up into the transmission lines. A lot of our fires in the past Pushed by strong winds will move across. You'll have a short danger area where the smoke is directly underneath the lines, um, where we have the risk of relays of those lines, where we'll have a short circuit caused by the smoke going through the transmission lines. Um, in this particular case, the fire not only went across uh, perpendicular to the lines, but it also went parallel too. So we had a lot of smoke um, in those lines for a longer period of time. Here's a view from the north. You can see where our transmission corridor, where we have all of our assets running through in that same area and where the fire is going across, essentially affecting every one of the circuits there. So I'm going to let Glenn take over from here. All right, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how this event affected the bulk electric system. That's 100 kV lines and above as defined by NERC. Um, so we'll go through this. Um, there was a total of 23 transmission line relays that happened in less than a 14-hour period during this event. Um, we typically have about two to three uh, types of these relays a month on a normal, normal month. Um, so, so 23 in 14 hours is a pretty significant number. Um, just a couple of the big ones I'll go through. Uh, a couple of lines out of Silmar relay. The very first one was that, uh, that one that uh, Brian showed. 
with the little red box of the gold Solmar line out of Solmar that was out for six days. Um, the Pacific DC intertie, both poles were out um, for about 21 hours. Um, the first 500 kV line was the Victorville Rinaldi line. That line relayed six times during this event. Um, the last time we left it out because there was just too much smoke. Um, and it was out for about nine and a half hours. The Atalanto Rinaldi, that's another 500 kV line um, that relayed a total of two times. Um, and it was left out for the same thing, about nine and a half hours. And then we had a couple lines out of uh, Silmar that Edison owns, the Party Silmar Line 1, that was out for about 21 hours. And then the Party Silmar Line 2, that also relayed, and uh, they restored that 21 minutes uh, later. All right, we'll just go through a very quick um, kind of presentation on our system. Um, and you can see at the top of the system how we have uh, three major imports into our uh, LA basin. That's the Pacific DC on the left the top. Uh, Victorville to LA, that's a path made up of five lines. Um, and the Barren Ridge uh, path, which we've had more talks today about with the renewables out in that area, um, made up of three lines. Um, and then on the bottom, you have our uh, in-basin generation. Um, one that's missing here is Castaic Power Plant that uh, is helpful with mitigating the Vic LA flows, but not so much the, the Pacific DC or Barren Ridge. Um, so we'll go through this. And some nice animation with the fires happening, kind of took out portions, if not all, of these lines. And so we go to the next one. Um, you'll see we, up in the top left we have, uh, it's a little hard for me to see, but top left there we have 1,240 megawatts on the Pacific DC is what LA gets. And then uh, we end up with uh, the number 3799 megawatts on the Vic LA, and then uh, 900 megawatts coming in from Barren Ridge. Um, so we, we had the complete loss of the Pacific DC during the fire. Again, that went to zero, and then a complete loss of the Barren Ridge lines. Uh, so that went to zero. So our import limit, um, you can see here, went from a 5939. Um, we go down to a 1442 with the loss of this transmission. Um, ultimately, after we put on some generation, a total uh, there of a little over 1,800 megawatts of generation completely online, we're able to cover our load. Our net capacity equals our total load. Um, and at the end of this event, we had about 135 megawatts of in-basin generation we still could have utilized to cover load. Um, but if load had been uh, greater than that 135, we would have had to shed customer load. Um, we'll go to the tick fire, a little less severe um, as far as not relaying any lines, but um, still a, a big fire. Um, the Pacific DC uh, started off being out for this during the, this was a week later. Um, starting out, it was out in between there for its yearly uh, inspection and repairs. That's, that's um, planned years in advance, uh, coordinated with other participants on the Pacific DC and the Bonneville Power Administration who operates the northern terminus. Um, this fire only got to about two to three miles away from most of our lines, so we ended up with no relays. Um, our imports uh, now are a little lower to begin with, 46.99, but again, we didn't lose any transmission, so it stayed there. Um, we did put on generation to make sure uh, we didn't have any problems, and our net capacity, uh, uh, pretty good, 68.54, and the load is a big thing on this day. This was a week later, but load went from 3,300 up to about almost 4,200, uh, much hotter. Um, and, and we ended up with a much higher load. Um, so we kind of looked at this. You can see the fires off to the, the, the west of our lines um, didn't have a problem there. But if we had lost um, the same lines we lost during the Saddle Ridge fire, if those had gone away and the imports went to 1442, on, on a day like this with the load being that high, we were about 600 megawatts. See our net capacity there is 3,600. Uh, we have a red thumbs down, meaning uh, we have less capacity than we have total load. Um, it's just a function of what the load was, what the, you know, the, um, the temperatures in the LA area are. So um, uh, uh, fortunately, we, we didn't have any lines relay. Um, we were prepared as much as we could be with all the generation, but we would have ended up being somewhere in the neighborhood of four to 600 megawatts uh, short and would have had to shed those customers, um, which a little over a quarter million customers uh, we're talking about there. But again, didn't happen in this case. Um, I'll let Brian, go ahead on this looking. You want to just do that from there? Yeah, essentially moving forward from here, what we're learning from the fires, obviously, um, is we have some, uh, some areas that we need to, to keep addressing. Um, we need to continue to harden our system. Um, part of our wildfire mitigation plan is exactly that. Um, it's alternative poles, it's steel poles, it's fiberglass arms, it's wider spread, it's different wire, tree wire, 
um, ACSR wire, um, essentially something with a steel core instead of our existing copper lines. It's upgrading our system uh, in these fire areas as our, our first plan of attack, essentially, and to continue moving forward where we're at on that. Um, our, uh, you know, another uh, issue that we have coming up is our distribution automation. This is going to help us react to the fires uh, more quickly, and we can automate a lot of our switching and working around uh, where the fires break out. Um, so those two things for our distribution system. For our transmission system, uh, we obviously have a lot of things that we need to look at. Uh, we have this corridor that comes down where the majority of our transmission assets come through and pass through one path. Um, we need to look at alternative transmission paths. Uh, one of our alternative paths, the Vic Century Lines 1 and 2, um, is the ones that, we, uh, that Jason had alluded to earlier. Um, we need to upgrade. Uh, so moving forward, that's, that's essentially our plan moving forward along with our fire mitigation plan uh, that should be coming out in the next month. Did it? Um, well, thank you, members. Um, a few months ago, we had heard from DWP with regards to the conversations in Sacramento about uh, wildfire liability. Um, I still have the same question. Um, should we be engaging in those conversations in Sacramento? Mr. Adams? We had that conversation a few months ago. I'm not sure if you recall. The whole PG&E Edison conversation, where do we fall in that conversation? So you know, this is a very interesting situation, uh, partic not particularly these fires, but um, looking at the Getty fire where, you know, we had the news that uh, we had just finished trimming about 248 trees in that immediate area where the fire began uh, in, in July. And then a tree uh, that was on property not under our control uh, uh, lost a branch in high winds and flew into the wires. And so, um, interestingly, while this is nothing that, that we or anyone in the city could have controlled or, or predicted, uh, you know, exactly which tree would, would throw a branch into our wires, it does raise a question about liability. And so um, we are planning to, uh, to work on this issue, as I had mentioned before, but the state, uh, there's, a, there's a difference between um, maintaining your system correctly and incorrectly versus dealing with things that are out of your control. In this case, uh, we have done everything that we could do. We've done everything right. Our system's constructed correctly. In fact, the wire that was affected by the tree continued to serve power during the entire fire and never went out of service. And so, uh, so it, it, uh, it, we had a, a strong system, structurally strong, electrically strong, doing exactly what it was supposed to do. At the same time, there are events out of our control that have affected that. And this is different than other fires we've seen, stories of lack of maintenance and, and deferred maintenance and things, you know, people not taking care of brush clearing. So uh, we will be engaging uh, with the state on how we deal with this issue because, um, as I mentioned before, the state of California is one of two states that, that goes by strict liability laws and does not really address proportional liability. And so uh, it's, it's seemingly incredible that you could have a bird land on a wire, a lightning strike, a drunk driver knock over a telephone pole, um, the police chase that caused a fire, I believe, in the Inland Empire, uh, could have ended it instead of a crash causing the fire, could have been a crash in a power pole that caused a fire. And would the utility be responsible for the all obligations of that fire when something completely out of their control occurred? So this is uh, an, an issue that I believe will be resolved. Um, uh, unlike uh, the investor-owned utilities, uh, in this case, uh, our investors are our residents of Los right. Angeles. And so... Um, but that's what makes it so unique. We're not unique. an investor-owned utility, so what, how can we make sure that we're protect, protecting so, our ratepayers? Right. So Besides hearing the maintenance issues and we're trimming back our trees, what else can we be doing? Um, should we be engaging in Sacramento? So we, we will be engaging in Sacramento on, on how, to re how to reduce... Um, the perception of liability. And so, you know, people talk about reducing liability. I don't think that the public wants to hear the words reduce liability because they see that electrical fires, you know, happen at times. And still only about 10% of the fires in the state are tied to electrical uh, ignitions. There's still 90% of other fires that need to be addressed. And so um, what I'm looking at is, is issues of force majeure, things that are, that are acts of nature outside of utilities control, which I think uh, would reasonably, to any, any, reasonable person would be something that is outside the ability to predict or control. And we'll be addressing those issues. We believe that it's exactly what happened in, say, the Getty instance. Um, and so uh, it, it is something that, that we will be very actively engaged in. There's a lot of discussion going on. And I think that we have a very a good and unique story to tell 
that we've done exactly what would be expected of us as a utility. Um, in our report to the board in December, as Simon mentioned, we'll be laying out our wildfire prevention plan, and this will be the first time that we've had to submit under a new law to the state exactly what the city is doing. It's a robust plan, and we'd be pleased to present it to the committee. Um, it tells exactly what we're doing to make sure our system is, is as resilient and reliable as we can make it within what we can control. But the issue of things out of our control absolutely has to be dealt with in the state. Yeah, I, I would suggest we do that. Why don't we agendize that so we can have a more robust um, conversation about that? Because this is not, we're not voting on anything today. Yeah. This is simply um, an update. But Mr. Koretz, I'm sure you have questions. I do have You've a few. Thank district. you, Madam Chair. Uh -huh. um, one question. Do we track as a utility the uh, projected future impacts of climate change and what fire impacts will look like when we're at 1.5 degrees to increase or 2% increase? You know, right now, in, in terms of climate change, the biggest thing we look at in terms of fire is, is fire risk maps that are produced by the state. And those maps are also replicated in the, the same territory by uh, LA Fire Department. And so we work closely together to look at the, the, the risk levels and the areas of highest risk. And so we have not tried to model independently what climate change might change, you know, how that might alter it. But I think the, the issue with climate change becomes, you know, in this arena, maybe become tree mortality or, or types of trees that, that may shed branches and things that are different. So this is, a, uh, this is an emerging area. There's talk throughout the state of are there trees that shouldn't be planted in California? Are, are there trees that are, that are inappropriate that cause risks? Um, the eucalyptus is such as uh, what was lost in this area is a you know, particularly oily tree. They conduct very well. And uh, the palm fronds do the same thing to us. Typically in the wintertime we have palm fronds flying during winter storms. Usually the problem there is they're wet and they come across conductors and they short out the conductors. So um, th there's, a, there's a lot of questions. I think there's a lot of issues in the state regarding fire clearance. We have robust clearance standards in Los Angeles. You know, are they robust enough around the houses that are in high fire zones? There's no standard statewide. What, is, what kind of exposure does that cause to utilities? So these are, there's a lot of questions. I don't think that, that they're all solely solved by the power industry by itself. Since you mentioned palm fronts, I think we... I don't know if we've changed our policy, but I know at least for a while we stopped trimming palm trees. Um, and uh, I believe even got rid of our palm tree trimming equipment. And that, that may be uh, adding to uh, uh, our risk. So I wonder if we should be looking at um, reviving that program and keeping our palm trees more closely trimmed because of the damage that it potentially causes. Yeah, I'm not aware of the, of the city's palm tree trimming, but of course even palm trees on private property, we've seen palm fronds fly up to a quarter mile, and so they could come from anywhere. And you know, this, this could have been a mylar balloon from a kid's birthday party that decided to fly halfway across the city and land on a power line. Could easily have been the same exact thing. Those are things that are not controlled easily by a utility. And so there's, there's a, a number of issues at hand, a number of possibilities that are, and things that are, that are out of our ability to control no matter what we do. And so um, these are the things that the state's really got to grapple with. And it is a statewide issue. Uh, if every utility in the state does a perfect job of maintaining their electrical infrastructure, it still doesn't mean that, that something won't spark a fire tied to a power line. And uh, on, on that particular subject, uh, I introduced a motion this morning to explore what it might take to underground our, all of our electric facilities in the hillsides and the high fire severity zones. Um, I know that gives you no time to prepare, and obviously at some point we'll get a full report. But yes, absolutely. What, what's your initial take on that thought? Well, you know, undergrounding is a, a solution. It's, it's costly which we know, and we know that it takes time to do. Um, and, and probably, and it's not, it's not all uh, end all be all in and of itself. It still it results in problems at times. There's outages sometimes due to different reasons. In the last fire, we did replace a certain amount of cable underground that was affected by the fire as well. Um, when there's an outage, it's more difficult to find. Um, we've had vault explosions, particularly in areas where there's gases in the ground. You may recall in La Brea area, because of the natural methane and stuff, we had vault explosions not that long ago, tied to natural gas seepage into the, into the areas in the vaults. So it's, it's not an end-all, be-all, but it does help. Um, as uh, Brian pointed out, 
um, the, where the fire was in the Saddle Ridge fire, we had underground power in that area, which helped. Um, we did lose poles, uh, but you know, poles also are able to be replaced and power was restored very quickly to our customers. So um, it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag. It, it, it is, a, it is a, a remedy. There's other remedies such as uh, coated wire. You know, the wire that, that we string is bare wire and that's the industry standard. You can do coated wire, but then you add a lot of weight for insulation. And so then you have to look at going steel poles, wire is thicker, it's more visible to the public, poles are closer together, there's a definite visual impact. So there's a number of remedies and we're looking and we're interested in your motion with the undergrounding is to what we might see as areas that, that would be prone to undergrounding. One of the hard things that I've been asked a question about power shutoffs, you know, would you shut power off for proactively in, in a, a fire and high fire risk? We have elected not to do that. We do not believe that's a good solution. Um, I think the state is coming to that realization at the same time based on the fallout from what's happened in shutoffs, particularly in Northern California. But again, where do you stop? Where do you start? And you know, where would we have would we have thought to shut off a line next to a freeway versus somewhere else? And uh, you know, you basically uh, completely disable the abilities to function of the city to function as a city when you do that. And so there's a there's a lot of big policy questions. Um, at the same time, we believe that providing reliable power every second of the day that we can is the most important mission that we have. And so, um, but we continue to look at this. It's an evolving area, and we will be engaged at every level that this discussion happens. Yeah, and certainly what you mentioned with. The, the wisdom of the shutoffs. Uh, I had relatives in the shutoff zones, and the problems were at least as bad as what you avoid uh, because they weren't able to communicate well uh, with people and let them know about evacuations. And the, the lack of power caused all kinds of other problems that made things worse when there was already a fire. There's a public watchdog group on power utilities, and their estimate, the last I heard, was that the shutoffs caused twice as much damage as the fires. And um, everything from food spoilage in 36 hours, the cell site batteries are dead, so you have no communication. Your ability to pump gas at a gas station, charge an electric vehicle, drive safely without traffic signals, um, th those are all impeded. Uh, hospitals closed down, uh, most surgeries are canceled. There's tremendous impacts uh, from doing such a thing. And so um, that's why we would never take a decision to do something like that lightly and, and we cannot consider that to be prudent. We have a tremendous fire department in LAFD that defends us. The question for us becomes how do you stop things that are just flat out of our control, out of anybody's control? And, and there may be other solutions in terms of protecting communities versus shutting power down. And I hope again that we'll look at it, at the undergrounding issue seriously, even though it's expensive. Oh, there may be some places in the city where it's more conducive than others. Right, right. And, it may uh, be appropriate for sure. And, and last question, uh, I know uh, uh, some folks in the fire severity areas have had their uh, fire insurance go up from, as an example, 3,000 to 12,000. Are we anticipating any more of that? And does the city have any kind of role in, uh, in pressuring the companies to not get yeah. so far out of line that people can't afford their fire insurance? Yeah, we're, we're not really engaged in any conversation about that. Um, I can tell you by experience that ourselves as a utility that we experience higher premiums and lower coverage and we're better off than most utilities in the state that, that have any kind of fire exposure. So uh, I'm certain what's happening to us is happening to homeowners or worse. Mm -hmm. And I've heard of stories of people that are not able to get insurance. So it, this is a, it's a much bigger question than, and it, even if there were no fires related to, to power systems anywhere in the state, you still have a number of fires occurring on their own. And so it's, it's a much bigger, broader issue, probably due to climate change and, and other things, bark beetle, dried trees and everything else. So people living on the more wilderness borders than they used to be. So um, we'll be part of that discussion and, and we're certainly gonna make sure that, uh, that a problem like this does not get pinned on the residents of Los Angeles. And if I might ask one follow-up question on that, have we had any conversations with insurance companies about asking them to kick in on some of our firefighting solutions like buying more uh, water dropping helicopters and planes? Because it certainly is as likely to save them money as us, so we should be asking them to help 
make the fires less likely. It, it's a it's a great idea. We have not discussed with insurance companies, but we have discussed that in Sacramento as as some of the options in terms of uh, you know, potential runaway liabilities. How do you, even the state, in terms of talking about setting up a, an insurance fund, like an earthquake insurance fund? There's questions. Well, what's the best use of that money? And and it seems that fire prevention and and stopping a fire may be the best way to expend money because just paying out damages every year is, is not a solution. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Koretz. I think there's a lot of people that want to engage in the conversation about undergrounding our utilities. Um, from the last estimates that I read in the paper, it's estimated to cost between a million dollars to three million dollars per mile. Yes. So the question is always going to be who pays for it. Mm -hmm. um, do all ratepayers pay for it, or do folks who live in these high-risk areas pay for it? Um, and if we go in that direction, I think we also need to revisit, essentially, I think it's like a tax, and we would have to, which requires Prop um, 218 vote, if, if I'm not mistaken. So these are all things to consider. Um, I think everybody in a perfect world would like us to do that, but someone needs to pay for this. Um, and the estimates that I've seen are extraordinary. High, so. Yep, you're correct, They're very high. And you could have an assessment district. You know, most utilities were put in by the developers. Some were built into everyone's home price was the initial price of both the water and power facilities, right. sewer and everything else that went in. Um, there are plans and areas where we underground over time, but to accelerate that would be, would be a, a change. But it may be warranted in certain cases, but it does bring up the question of who pays and, and is that the best solution for fire? It may take care of a fire risk due to utility, but it doesn't take care of every other fire risk as well. So so that, you know, we really need to look at the whole range of solutions. But I think it's it's probably a component of, of in certain places, you know, you know, a good move. And you will have communities in other parts of the city who will feel like they're subsidizing yeah, that's some of this. Issue, yeah. And is that fair? Um, so there's a lot of things to consider. Like I said, there's no action to be taken this afternoon. I do would like for your plan to come back in the next um, few weeks. Um, so we can have um, a further discussion on what that plan looks like. Um, and again, I think we owe a tremendous amount of gratitude to our firefighters who are out there battling um, these fires, including our DWP crews who are out there working around the clock to uh, both maintain safety and reliability. So thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Kokorian had... Um, Asked me to hold item number eight, but he had to step out to another committee, so he asked me to go ahead and if there's no objection in approving number eight, can we move forward with that? No objection. All right, no objection. No objection. That would be the order to approve item number eight. Uh, there's nothing else on our agenda this afternoon, so our meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.